But you wish sometimes you could just stop and hold the moment. Bask. This is one of those times. I'm not sure when you first heard these words, but uh, if it helps, close your eyes and go back to maybe one of your first memories of hearing these words. From Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning with verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son. And he named him. Jesus, the Word of God for God's people this day. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, in this season of joy, grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be found acceptable in your sight. And help us to keep Christmas in a way that is holy and pleasing to you. In the name of the one born in the manger. Amen. If we're not careful, here in the church staff, we can get in a rut. And we start thinking about everything that happens inside these walls and the business that we need to tend to. and um, We get in the rut. So we decided a few years ago that this time of the year we've got to get out as a staff and we need to go to those people that can't come to us so we go Christmas carol. It's the fourth year now that we've been involved with this. Darian says we've made good progress. <laughs> <laughs> Except for me. <laughs> so last week we visited an independent living center where a dear member of this church lives uh, 102 years old, Geneva Dalton, 102. And she received us into her small room and she stood there just with perfect posture and just as politely as she could, she listened to our attempts to spread Christmas joy. We should have had the sanctuary choir with us. 102, born in 1911. 102 years old. And as we were leaving, someone asked Miss Geneva, they said, uh, so tell us what it feels like to be 102 years old. And, and for a, she thought for just a moment, and then with great clarity, and, and you'd have to know her, she's got a mischievous spirit about her. Amen. 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 <laughs> uh, here's what she said, and it stopped me in my tracks. And I asked her if I could not share this with you so I'm not uh, betraying her confidence. She said, you know, we live and we die and that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> now, David and Mary Beth may not think that I'm capable of being a great theologian, but I had to think about that one. <laughs> we live and we die and that's pretty much it. 
you know, in a way that was unsettling to me because see, it's sort of a finality. There's a resignation. Where's the hope? But she said a Methodist minister told her that. So I had to dig deeper. And then I remembered who Miss Geneva, you know, who, who her contemporaries were and are. And she had very few that still are. Uh, but uh, they were the same generation as my father's. They were the ones who survived the Great Depression in their younger years. They were the ones who uh, were called to stop Hitler's mad march to take over the entire world. They were the ones who listened as FDR proclaimed uh, war on Japan. They were the ones who came back from that war and wanted nothing more than to live in peace and, and to pursue uh, their lives and to help build strong institutions and good businesses that treated people decently and honestly. And uh, there was about them in every conceivable way courage. And so I got to her meaning eventually, and I think she's saying the same thing that Shakespeare expressed in Julius Caesar, Act Two, Scene Two, where Shakespeare penned these words, cowards die many times before their deaths, but the valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Death will come when it will come. And I think that was her meaning. But before I got to that meaning, the meaning that you should live your life fully because it is punctuated by birth and death, I had to struggle a little bit. And a line from probably the best movie of all times besides It's a Wonderful Life. That's the best movie of all time. But the second best movie has got to be Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> <laughs> you would debate? Uh, now, if you've seen the movie Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? You know that there, it's about some escaped convicts. And they're on this odyssey. And they're, they're trying to run, and they're, they're, at one point they're cornered in a barn loft, and the sheriff is out there with the bloodhounds and the shotguns poised at them, and he's getting ready to torch the barn that they're in, and he said, you better give yourselves up. Your situation is pretty nigh on the hopeless. And that's the line that struck me. Because there are times in this life when our situations are pretty nigh on to hopeless, aren't they? And maybe for you as Christmas Eve draws near, as Christmas draws near, you can relate or identify to at least one or two places in your life where your situation seems somewhat hopeless. Because the place of hopeless, hopelessness is a dark place place, a foreboding place. It's like a forest that we can get lost in. I've been lost there before. <clears throat> we can be lost in the deep woods of guilt over something we said or something we did a long time ago, and we're unable to forgive ourselves. It's possible to lose our way in worry over a child who, who seems confused or seems to not be on track or headed in a direction that we would think that they would be. And it may be that our broken hearts remain at the side of a grave of a loved one and we're unable to leave that place, we're unable, unable to move forward. It may be that loneliness has overcome us and we find ourselves in a dark cave of isolation. It may be that an addiction has us beast-like in its grip. Poor health may have trapped us and we're wondering who will come and set us free. We may be tangled in the vines of discontent. We may be up a tree of our own arrogance and not be able to climb down. We can find ourselves sickened even by the deceitful tendencies that lurk within ourselves. Or the disappointment of betrayal of one we have trusted with our very lives, one we perhaps took vows with. 
may have left us in a place where we feel our situation is pretty nigh on to hopeless. And we may feel, in a single word, lost. But if so, if we do, we should be able to identify with the generations from Abraham to David. From King David to the deportation from Babylon, <coughs> and from the deportation to Babylon to the coming of the Messiah. Because humans have felt that way since the dawn of recorded time. Until one night, over 2,000 years ago, when the cry of a newborn baby first pierced the night air as God in human form breathed into God's own lungs the very air that God had created. And in that instant, as a newborn baby cried for the first time, the pages of history were literally torn in two. A new world order came into being, and at the very center of that world order was a living hope, Jesus. Jesus, the Christ. And death will come when it will come. And we all still live, and we all still die, but... Pretty much nothing will ever be the same again, and there's more to it. Because death will never again hold the same power or the same sway. The unfathomable mystery that makes sense of everything before and after is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And on that night, in places not too far removed. The sky lit up in a blinding fashion. The dividing line between heaven and earth seemed to fall away. Angels appeared on the horizon telling shepherds not to fear. And the greatest party this earth has ever known didn't even need to include spiked eggnog or an elaborate food display. It took place, and all of creation burst forth in singing and in celebration, because the one who is able to lead us from the lostness of this life had arrived. The God who made earth and heaven came to redeem the creation. In the space of several decades, this same child will become a man unlike any man who'd ever lived before or since. And he would respond to the accusation that our, pretty, our situation is pretty nigh unto hopeless with answers beyond our creative abilities to imagine. That young man would promise a Samaritan woman sitting at a well that whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. The water that I give them shall be a spring of water welling up in them to eternal life. And it will be written of him, while we were yet helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Sometimes in the church we joke about Christmas and Easter people. Truth is, there can be no separation of Christmas and Easter. They are one. Christ was born that Christ might die, that Christ might be raised. He came to earth in human form. That you and I might live and die, and yes, even do that sometimes courageously. But that that's pretty much it. Is not a statement of resignation or a finality, but of hopefulness. For the one who saves doesn't call from far away, beckoning us to come to him. The one who saves doesn't shout out directions or instructions to you and me, admonishing us to do better, to try harder. No. The one who saves took on human form, came and wrapped his divine arms around us, and is pulling us to safety. God has reached down into the hopelessness of our situation. 
novelist Reynolds Price once wrote that there is one sentence, one sentence that all of humankind craves to hear, that the maker of all things loves and wants me. God has reached out. When our children were in their middle school years, we had these dear friends, John and Leah Phillips. They're some of the finest people you'd ever want to know. And our children were about the same age. They had uh, an older son and a set of younger twins, two boys. And they were in, we were all in the same Sunday school class. We did a lot of things together. We'd uh, do anything for our kids. And um, we would look after their children. They'd look after our children. We trusted one another. But the middle school years are difficult years, as I recall. And somebody said you ought to just put a child in a barrel during that time. <laughs> bring them out when it's all done. But there's one thing that if you remember those years, probably most all of us have gone through, or if you're getting ready to go through those, or you're going through them right now, and it's something called braces. <laughs> now, let me tell you, for those of you parents who are young and not yet been through braces, imagine a car payment coupon book. <laughs> Multiply it times five, and you've got braces. It's an investment. It is an investment. And somewhere in that process of braces, there was something known as a retainer. Now, a retainer was a very personal thing. Uh, it's fitted for your mouth. It's worth its weight in gold. I mean, it, it, these things could cost a lot. But children that age are always inevitably losing their retainers, aren't they? So on one occasion, we're at this church retreat center. And the Phillips needed to be somewhere else. So Lane and I were in charge. When after dinner time, Andrew, the, the youngest, one of the twins, came to us and that he looked white as a ghost. He was terrified. Because apparently there had been some history about him and his retainer. And he knew. And he, he, we asked him when he remembered. He said, I remember putting it in a, a paper napkin and putting it on my tray before dinner. <laughs> and so we said, no problem. No problem. It's, it's gone down that little conveyor belt thing. We'll just go back in the kitchen and we'll find it. Well, we went back there and we talked to the kitchen staff and they said, uh-uh. It's in the dumpster. Well, Lane and I looked at each other. We said, oh, that's tough. <laughs> but we look back at Andrew, and Andrew was, uh, I mean, pretty not under hopeless. Okay. He'd have it. He thought his goose was cooked. And Lane and I looked at each other, and then I did the, the selfless thing, the valiant thing, what any red-blooded American male would do. I put my hands like this and I said, here, honey. <laughs> and I lifted her in the dumpster. And there was, I mean, there was gross stuff. Chicken bones, decaying vegetables, rotten cabbage, it was all in there. But Lane is a former lifeguard. And after about 10 to 15 minutes, she comes up like she retrieved buried treasure from the bottom of the ocean with this retainer. And what followed was a sense of peace and celebration after a long hot shot. <laughs> and it all was well. But it would not have been so without an intervention. And friends, what I want to convey to you this morning is this, that the incarnation of Jesus Christ was history's greatest intervention. And there is cause for celebration. 
And if you don't leave here this morning feeling that deep down in your bones, then I have failed you. For the prophet Isaiah would say that the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who have lived, those who have abided in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. I do not mean to compare this beautiful creation that we live in to a dumpster. But the world is broken and at times messy and dark. And God has reached down because God has seen that our situation was pretty nigh unto hopeless. And God, because God loves us and God want, wants us, God has reached down and redeemed you and me through Jesus Christ and is redeeming the entire creation. As God has jumped in with both feet and is here with you now. God is present. God is with us in a world that sometimes seems so dark and so lost. And so today we are called upon to feel that and to rejoice and to give thanks and join that ancient chorus and burst forth in song of celebration. Now we will sing in just a few moments. But before we do, I'd like to give you the opportunity to consider how even in the midst of what sometimes seems to be hopelessness, God has been with you. God is with you. God will be with you. And to give thanks to God. I'm going to ask Terry to play through a few stanzas of the hymn we will soon sing. Darius will come to lead us. And I, I, I would just pray that all of our voices be employed this morning. But before that, in this time of reflection, you may want to slip out and come to the altar rail. You may want to be in prayer where you are. But consider how God is present with you, even now. <clears throat> 